Humanity and discussion on what is human nature is an eternally twisted topic. Whilst on one hand humanity is able to show great empathy, from memorials to battles where enemies recognized each other's humanity, to the moment where the entire world was saved by actions of a single man who was unwilling to press the big red button. On the other hand, this is what an average discussion or debate uh, looks like. <coughs> Yeah, not exactly civil and empathetic. To be honest, debates are basically free real estate for pseudo-intellectual masses to participate in the shit-slaying contest, where things like logic, reason, or basic common sense is thrown away to see their right side victorious. Now, I'm not a political commentary channel. I don't make an hour-long video essay on Did the Sims make you gay? Ooh, I'll have to watch this one later. But I'm some bumbling dumbass in my room studying for a history degree and hyperfixating on random stuff. Which means... Video games. And I think I don't need to give a trigger warning for a late 90s, early 2000s moral panic or violent video games. But when was the last time you noticed that your enemy in most cases is human? Yeah, he can be of different nationality, a terrorist or both or none. But have you ever considered that if this was real and you had to come face to face with an enemy, would you hesitate? Would they hesitate? Now imagine the same but in multi-million dollar fighter dress and you get the basic playthrough of an ace combat game, where all faceless enemies are husks just like you. While your story-defined allies and rivals follow their assigned cliché, either developing or just maintain a sense of danger, and whilst Ace Combat 4 isn't revolutionary, it does something a bit different, or at least that's what FEMA is sensed out. Welcome to the continent of Yuzhia, a smaller continent compared to Osia or Verusa, but not less important as this continent is the most prominent in the series, featured in Ace Combat 1, 2 and 3 after the introduction of Strange Reel, and in Ace Combat 4, 7 and partially 5 due to the existence of Arcade Mode. Now to the actual history lesson. Since I doubt I will cover Ace Combat 1 and 2, nor will I spend all of your time going extremely in detail, I will recommend Solotos, Everstalls, Planfall and Aftermath videos that go much more in depth of the events I will describe. <clears throat> 1994. Eugene scientists discover a meteor that might threaten the Earth. This meteor is soon dubbed Ulysses 1994 XF04. 1996. An announcement is made by the Federation of Central Eugia. The Ulysses will enter Earth's orbit and shatter, setting fragments all around the globe, with the continents of Eugia and Ania being prime targets of the Shars. The news caused the governments of Eugia to unite and build a railgun defense threat, codename Stonehenge. 1997-1998 Despite having contingency options due to the sudden Eugian coup d'etat, these options being an anti-asteroid laser weapon deployed via satellite, and the missile arsenal of Fortress and Tolerance were destroyed to prevent the Loyalists from being crushed and to prevent a missile strike on the Union of Yuxubanian Republics that would provoke a retaliation by the superpower. After the war, Stonehenge, being the last hope of Yuji's survival, was finished. All that they could do is wait. July 3rd, 1999. Ulysses enters Earth's atmosphere and breaks apart. Shards rapidly tumbling down from the sky only to be met with explosive shells from Stonehenge's eight railguns, keeping them away from populated areas, only for Railgun 4 to be struck by a shard and be put out of commission, just as one of the shards was heading for Federal Republic of Arugia's capital city, Farbanti. Impact imminent. July 4th, 1999 to August 22nd, 2003. Eugia was scarred but not destroyed. Arugia suffered greatly as one of the shards struck into the nearby waters and sunk the western municipal district of Farbanti. To this day, remnants of skyscrapers float and rot away. The consequential refugee crisis would only worsen Arugia's woes, as they were unfit not only to deal with their own crisis, but also bear the brunt of the rest of Arugia's crises. Tensions rose, and economic sanctions soon followed, only burying Arugia deeper into mud. Enough was enough. 
this betrayal was to be repaid in full. And so by August 22, 2003, Eurasian armed forces would move into the territories of the nation of San Salvation and take control of Stonehenge, starting the Eugian Continental War. In response, Eugia would unite into the Independent State Allied Forces, or ISAF, but that wouldn't help them against the railgun array. Now a weapon of aerial dominance, ISAF would retreat off of mainland Eugia to the island of North Point, where the story of Ace Combat 4 Shattered Skies, or Distant Thunder in the European version, begins. Like always, Ace Combat 4's story is divided into two perspectives, the first being of the mysterious narrator, who was but a child when the war broke out, living with his family in the countryside of San Salvation. One day he went out for school, only to see two planes dogfighting, an Erosian Su-37 came out on top and the burning ISA wreck crashed right into the narrator's house, leaving him an orphan of war. The SU-37 had the yellow number 13 written on its tail, and the child swore to find him and potentially confront him. The second perspective is of one of the many ISAF pilots, flying under the call sign Mobius-1. And the situation is dire. It is September 19th, 2004. The war has been raging on for almost an entire year, and the last ISAF stronghold, Island of North Point, is under threat as diversion by Erugian saboteurs destroyed the early warning network and the squadron of bombers is now making its way to one of their many targets, Allen Ford Air Base. And we, the literal scraps of ISAF Air Force, have to stop them. Despite being on last legs, we successfully repelled the attack and win just enough time to take a breather. The narrator continues his story moving to the city to live with his drunkard uncle, who was once a taxi driver checking the skies for Yellow 13, only for erosion occupation to come. Language and rules of living changed. Police was replaced with military police, rations instead of shops, censorship of broadcasts instead of TV, and horse-drawn carts rather than combustion-powered vehicles. The narrator adapted and played his lip harmonica at a local bar that served occupation forces right below his uncle's apartment, earning spare change from soldiers. Back to the front lines, whilst we repelled a single attack, we are not safe from further attacks as the Wrigley Air Base on the mainland acts as a knife to ISAF's throat. And call it our lucky day, another major squadron of bombers arrived. Intent is obvious, they will attempt another bombing run on our remaining forces. So we use this as an opportunity to win more time and simply level Wrigley to the ground while the bombers are there. Luckily our starter F4 Phantom is equipped with bombs and this mission is smooth sailing. In the meantime, behind enemy lines, a group of soldiers would kick out the occupation force out of the bar. These were not some cannon fodder, these were Russian airmen from the Yellow Squadron. Eventually, the star of the show, Yellow 13, made his appearance, strumming his guitar, and it just so happened that he noticed the narrator and invited him to play along. Soon the sounds of guitar and lip harmonica filled the room, as by some miracle, they played the narrator's father's favorite song. On the ISAF side, nothing is well, as it turns out not all soldiers made it across and are awaiting evac at St. Tark. Unfortunately, the Russian radar base at Mount Chesna is putting the evacuation in jeopardy. We have multiple radars to destroy and this mission will teach us about returning to base, as after the successful completion of the mission, we have to fly all the way back to the return line. The evacuation succeeds, but more trouble arises as Erugians are moving supplies and deploying troops into the Comberf Harbor, which houses Erugia's so-called Invincible Asia Fleet, and it's speculated that the Asia Fleet will be used to strike at North Point. The ISAF command decides it is time to put Erugians in their place and strike at their transport planes, which, for probably the only time in the entire game, are protected by jammer aircraft which I noticed only block out a portion of your radar rather than influence the lock-on of your missiles or somehow make them less accurate like in Ace Combat 7. This is also the first time where we get to enjoy a fair portion of dogfighting. With transports now burning wrecks, our next goal is to strike at Asia Fleet supply lines. The oil refinery is just off the coast, which are the only petrochemical facilities supplying the ships. Strike there and the ships won't have any fuel to run away with, basically sitting ducks. Like the title of the first mission. Bombs make easy work of the sea-bound oil rigs, but with our munitions depleted and plane damage from enemy interceptors, 
a new kind of threat appears over the horizon. Mobius 1, heavy group, hot. Appears to be five targets in the group. Now, usually when the game is like, oh, you know, you can fight these obviously superior fighters, but you should probably run with your tail between your legs, pretty please. My usual response is to start blasting, but with 9 missiles and only 21 rounds in my machine gun, I barely get a couple of stray rounds to connect and have to scurry away. Whilst we have successfully cut off the Azure Fleet's lifeline, the narrator continues his tale. The Yellow Squadron would use San Salvation as their headquarters, a new highway turned runway, and road tunnels turned into improvised hangars for the SU-37s. Now, here's where the Western and Japanese versions slightly differ. The narrator wants to confront the L-13. In the Western version, it's a moral confrontation, making Yellow 13 face the facts that he, even if on accident, killed this child's civilian father. But in the Japanese version, he actually bought a gun and a knife so he could kill Yellow 13. Take revenge if you say so. Moving on. The narrator mentions Yellow 13's partner, the only female in the squadron, Yellow 4. The narrator was amazed by Yellow 13's piloting skills, not to mention his own code of honor, as he prides himself not on his body count, but on the fact that he never lost a wingman, and if he is ever to be shot down by a worthy pilot, he would bear no resentment. The time has come for ISAF to strike at Comberg Harbor, which houses the now immobilized Asia fleet, which turns the whole mission into an all-you-can-eat bombing buffet. Drop bombs on parked ships, on dock facilities, dogfight enemy interceptors, destroy the retreating ships. It's the first time we secure an undeniable offensive victory against Arugia. Next we have a strategic target, the solar power plant in Faith Park. According to our briefing, they equal nuclear reactors in power and are responsible for 60% of Arugia's military industry. And since we can't just blow up, you know, the f***ing sun, we'll have to destroy the panels themselves. Not to mention, this will also act as a distraction from our potential return to the mainland. You get away with it this time! And the mission goes smoothly, just like always. Attention all aircraft, incoming from Stonehenge, confirmed on radar. Drop below 2,000 feet and head south to exit combat area. 2,000 feet? What do they expect us to do, go underground? Oh, forgot to tell you. This mission takes place right in the radius of Stonehenge's effective range. So dive into the rain and skedaddle out of there. And the victory is a pyrrhic one, as the losses from Stonehenge exceed expectations, and not all is well in the narrator's story, as his uncle vanished, potentially taken away by the secret police for his anti-Rusian comments, and so the narrator basically found himself sticking with the Yellow Squadron, only on a fateful night to stamp into a room he shouldn't have seen, and find out that the barkeep and his family were all members of the resistance, collecting any intelligence of the Rusian forces, and whilst normally he would have been killed Killed, the barkeep's daughter, who worked as a waitress, protected him, only because he was too young to know better. The narrator concludes that the Resistance were the real heroes in this situation, and he, of all people, found haven amongst the invaders. But who can judge him? Where could he go? If he's now all on his own, the closest thing to a garden that he had was soon taken away, and I doubt the barkeep really cared what happened to him, but in a way, the Yellow Squadron cared, even if they're the villains of the war. Actually, if we considered the lore, this war could have been more of an act of desperation rather than some evil act of stealing people's land. That's the name of the game. There's like something about launching a satellite at the Guana Islands to help with the naval counter invasion of mainland Asia, but eh, we all know this mission for its banging soundtrack and massive dogfight.
Also, it's the first time we managed to somewhat hurt the yellow squadron. Whilst we can't outright shoot them down yet, we managed to clip one of them with three missiles and force the squadron into a retreat. And this moment of badassery is ruined by a harsh reminder in the offer story as the resistance is getting excited for ISF's counter invasion. Only the offer is concerned with the fate of Russian soldiers. The barkeep's daughter replies, as a member of the resistance, that, well, it's only fair that the Russians will be kicked out. They're occupiers, they have no place here. So, in this case, she might not have meant it, as she had a crush on Yellow 13, who had a partner in Yellow 4. She was always by Yellow 13's side, even when the squadron composition changed. 13 and 4 were the only constants and developed trust in each other. Oh, this time the only thing that mattered to 13 was our performance at Komona Islands, hoping that if we last just long enough, we might become a worthy opponent in the future. Unlike most antagonists in Ace Combat, Yellow 13, weirdly, doesn't seem to develop any malice towards the player character, or just doesn't try to demoralize us. He simply does his job and hopes for a worthy opponent. As an ace who at this point scored so many kills, he outright doesn't care that he's the best pilot Arugia has at the moment. But it seems Arugia is about to show weakness. January 24th, 2005. Operation Bunker Shot. ISAF is ready for the counter invasion at the Halle, Crown, and Karanda beaches. We will act as close air support and try and prevent the invasion from ending in disaster by targeting enemy facilities such as machine gun nests and pillboxes, enemy artillery, and of course destroying enemy radars and armored vehicles. But soon we have to deal with reinforcements of A10 warthogs who could easily shred through our troop. That's why you fly in a plane that is capable of dogfighting, because if you fly an A-10 against A-10s, this is where you might run out of time since you won't be able to maneuver as easily and won't have an advantage. And we slowly reach a point where I just have to skip over submissions due to how unimportant they are, and because they expose one of my least favorite design quirks in these games. About that later. But in lamest terms, we need to assault Ista's fortress since it's nine penetrable due to it being in a f***ing mountainous jungle. And dear god, 20 minute missions are the bane of my existence. Next, we got a group of Russian defectors who worked on Stonehenge attempting to escape to ISAF territories aboard civilian Air Ixium airliners. But they're chased by Russian interceptors. They offer their knowledge on Stonehenge in exchange for amnesty and political asylum. The situation gets tricky as one of the aircraft, Flight 701, was shot at and now has a damaged cabin, meaning it can only stay at low altitude. Not to mention the captain getting caught by shrapnel and being taken care of while the plane is piloted by first officer. Or K Nagase. For context, K was one of your wingmen in Ace Combat 2, but she doesn't have any connection to K Nagase from Ace Combat 5 and 7. Not to mention that K Nagase is basically the unofficial mascot of the series. Kind of like the pilot Nugget plush, but that's me going off on a tangent. What's important is that we single handedly protect both aircraft from erosion fighters. And for the narrator, the situation in San Salvation is getting dire, or maybe hopeful, depending on the perspective, as bombs arriving at Yellow Squadron's base meant that ISAF were getting close. The resistance would target the highway turned runway, which would wound Yellow 4 and also destroy any reserve supplies, which was important as the ISAF invasion put the supply lines into jeopardy. At least the narrator knows this from the constant complaints of the squadron's crew chief. This would also annoy Yellow 13, as he found the idea of being killed while he's forcibly grounded, displeasing. Rather, he died in battle in the air. Soon, news of what's to come arrived, and everyone took off. But Yellow Force plane was not fitted with bombs, making it lighter. Alas, it didn't help, as one of the engines was nearly bust from the explosion. But what was to come? 2nd of April, 2005, Operation Stonecrusher. At last, ISF is ready to attempt another strike at Stonehenge. As it turns out, the railgun array is fitted with an ECM jammer down the middle, which was disabling any guidance systems on ISF planes, which makes the jammer our first priority. The mission might be tough, but we need to push through. This one is tough, 
We have seven cannons to destroy, an array of SAMs and AA guns, and a couple of Russian patrol craft to deal with. Personal tip, you can use bombs to one-shot the cannons, but due to how bomb aiming worked in older games, it might be hard to land a good shot, especially at lower altitudes and higher speeds. But just keep breathing and keep going at it. Better live for a while longer than restart the whole mission. With Stonehenge and surrounding defenses reduced to scrap metal, a new threat appears on the horizon. Yellows will not make it easy. SC-37s are still more maneuverable than my Eurofighter Typhoon, being able to pull 90 degree Cobra turns. But we could try and follow them in the crosshair and land a solid amount of machine gun rounds into them while they try and stall into a Cobra. Try not to stick to one plane. Yells are persistent and their pilots know when to focus on dodging and playing time. But after catching one of them in a dive and then firing missiles last minute, we can from a kill on the yellow 4. Despite losing his wingman, 13 never showed weakness to people around him. Only the narrator found out when he spotted 13 all alone, clinging to Forrest's handkerchief that still carried the scent of her perfume. When 13 became aware of narrator's presence, he vented out, saying that 4 can't complain as she chose to go out with her SU-37 in desperate need of repair, and that her death, in a way, is her responsibility. He opened up about his story with 4, as it turns out he knew 4 ever since she was a kid, before Pilot Academy and before she became a fighter pilot. These words simply left his mouth with no direction. They were not targeted at the narrator. The Yellow Squadron situation wasn't any better, as most skilled pilots were redirected to other squadrons, whilst the empty spaces were filled in with rookies. 13 would show everyone the newspaper clipping of Mobius 1's victory over Stonehenge, and state that this is what's worthy of praise, as despite being enemies, there was still basic honor and respect between each other, unlike the Resistance, who kept to their red burrows and only fought through cowardly sabotage. The narrator concludes that Isef was coming to San Salvation. We get a closer glimpse at 13's values. Whilst maybe it's my personal belief that blaming 4 for her own demise is a sort of coping mechanism, as his grand achievement, never losing a wingman, was shattered as 4 took off with a broken engine and consequently got shot down by us. Even though in gameplay she and her wingman put up quite a fight, what I wanted to talk about is his sense of honor, or having a sort of need to fight on equal grounds with his opponent, as well as not exactly pursuit, rather desire to face an opponent as powerful as him. Now it almost reflects the player's motivation, at least it did mine. Every time Yellow Squadron appeared I just knew this is the boss and I should show them what I'm made of. And even I would be a bit pissed off if there was a reveal where due to actions of saboteurs we had to fly a broken down plane. It would add to a challenge, yeah, but the pain of loss would only be soured. You didn't lose because you failed, you lost because someone rigged the game against you. Am I overanalyzing a dumb arcade game about flying fighter jets in a bad shit insane alternative world where a country thought that nuking itself seven times is an effective defense strategy? Yes. With Stonehenge destroyed, we are full speed ahead to defeating Erugia. But first we need to save a U-2 spy plane that was sent behind enemy lines, as it now carries valuable intel that might guarantee our victory until we're passing over Gnome Ravine. Ooh, problem? The ravine is crammed full of jammer aircraft, which completely disables the U-2's navigation system and screws over our radar as well as breaks our missile guidance system, meaning we have to target them manually with our machine gun. Also, it's another mission that I would complain about, but that's later. As for our current situation with the path carved out, the U-2 spy plane approaches, only to reveal that it is being chased by Russian fighters. Luckily, they don't provide much of a threat, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows. The YouTube spy plane brought intel that the Russians are constructing a new WMD, simply known as Megalith. 
and our entire strategy now hinges on ending this war before Megalith is finished. Next mission is not as important, but the gist of it is that ice have will land on the northern part of the continent to open a second front, and we are to intercept any Russian cruise missiles, which turns out to have had a nuclear warhead in one of them. Alas, Sun Salvation is dead ahead in our offensive, meaning that our narrator would witness the mass retreat of our Russian troops, as well as them setting up AA guns atop hospitals, which even the yellow fire team was disappointed over. Mandatory blackouts were put in place, which the resistance used to plant explosives. But one of the members, the barkeep's daughter, botched it. She was spotted by a patrol and barely hid away in an alleyway. But to her shock, a nondescript car was occupied by none other than 13, and as a dead silence settled among them, the barkeep's daughter, the one who bombed the runways and in a way killed the old four, as well as caused so much anger in 13, stood right in front of him. Yet it was hard to truly hate the one who was so close to him over the spirit of occupation. But the narrator, who witnessed the whole ordeal, intervened last minute. Get out of our town, you fascist pig. Those were the words from my mouth. As 13 couldn't comprehend the hatred from the people close to him, he soon let them run away as patrols were closing in. Another version difference is the narrator in the Japanese version holds 13 at gunpoint. The next morning went as if nothing happened, only the resistance planned to break the blackout as soon as ISAV would reach the city. 10th of July, 2005, midnight, Operation Firefly. We are entering San Salvation. Originally neutral, but under Erosion occupation. We have three main areas to target, being the New Town, Old Town and the Airport. As well, we need to keep track of any enemy air reinforcements. The resistance will light up the whole city like a massive Christmas tree, so it's easier to target Erosion vehicles and defense positions. The yellows are also deployed to intercept us, but just like in Stonehenge, it's possible to shoot them down. Amidst all the fire and radio comms, we also catch interference from a radio broadcast reporting on the battle, though, due to radio censorship, it's patchy at best. From sky rises to government complexes to small roads. San Salvation is in a state of war, as shrapnel, scrap metal and missiles fill the ground and air. Soon, the liberation comes. But the Russians decide to do one final push, sending in bombers to level anything left, but they too go up in smoke. The streets soon fill with people chanting the anthem. The Russian orange is replaced by ISF's and Salvation's blue. AA gunners were captured by resistance, and the Russian troops were lined up by ISAF. The yellow squadron retreated and ISAF planes filled the skies. Among them was Mobius 1. As one question lingered in the narrator's head, what would happen if 13 and Mobius were destined to meet or the battlefields. The narrator followed the retreating troops. ISAF is facing the last roadblock between them and the Russian capital of Farbanti, the Whiskey Corridor, a naturally defensible position, a desert with mountains forming a corridor. The Russians are putting all their troops on the line as a final gambit and are outnumbering ISAF's force. This victory hinges on a close air support miracle. If we lose, we might lose it all. But since my current F-15 carries large bombs, any outposts, enemy tank brigades, or even close air support helicopters are swiftly blown to smithereens. 19th of September, 2005. Over two years since the war broke out, and exactly a year since our deployment at North Point. As part of Operation Autumn Thunder, we will attack from the western coast whilst the armored divisions will move into the open whiskey corridor to the east. Time is of the essence, as Megalith is nearing the final stages of construction to buy our final plane, the experimental F-15 SMTD, which in the game is wrongly named the F-15 Active, since Active was a later experimental model which had a sort of long tube on the front, which the SMTD in-game lacks. Anyways, I will let you enjoy the moment for a bit, because Farbanti is one of my most favorite tracks in the whole series. The outcome of the war rests on you, so stay focused on what's at hand. Remember, survival is paramount. Good luck to you all, and Mobius One. An end to the war would be a nice birthday gift as well. Mobius One, engage.
have to face a 5 plane formation of the Yellow Squadron in a 1v5 dogfight. As you'll have 13 warrants, they will engage as a formation, so whenever you're on someone's tail, get ready to quickly break from any missile behind you. All their planes are the same mold as Su-37s, so expect Cobra maneuvers, but by this point your plane is maneuverable enough to instead turn this strength into a weakness. As 37s stall, they turn into sitting ducks for missiles and machine gun fire, and ironically, as all his wingmen are picked off one by one, 13 goes down stuck in that stall, as the F-15's machine gun rips the plane to shreds. The war is won. After a success, Arugia finally surrendered and agreed to ISAF's terms, which include the establishment of an ISAF interim government on the territories of Arugia. And though much blood has been spilled in this battle alone, we can breathe a sigh of relief. Yellow 13's remains never left that wreck. Wherever it was, only Yellow Force keepsake handkerchief made its way back to the ground and into narrator's hands, still keeping a faint scent of that same perfume. The narrator and the barkeep's daughter would bury the handkerchief as a makeshift grave for a yellow 13 or 4. Though that no longer mattered. In a way, they were already reunited in death, becoming one single entity in the narrator's mind. And they rested in peace, facing the ace who 13 so desired to come up against. He didn't die on the ground lying, but fighting to the bitter end. There was no resentment, no hate, only pure mutual respect between aces. Which brings back the tales of yore from World War I and II, where, despite fighting on opposite sides of the barricades, pilots would develop a code of honor towards each other, which is now somewhat rare. But this melancholic sigh of relief is interrupted by the deafening silence of our predicament. A week has passed from our victory, but the fate of the continent rests in our hands. The damned Erosians finished Megalith, and a group of young officers are planning to use it. Megalith is a missile complex fitted with ICBMs that are supposed to be fired into the orbit to blow the dormant Ulysses shards back to Earth, potentially wiping out Eugia as we know it. Not to mention its damn fortress. Only way to stop it is to blow it open from the inside. That's why a newly established Mobius squadron will be deployed, along with commandos to open up the facility for assault and eliminate not only the remaining enemy forces, but also destroy Megalith, for it is Judgment Day. Once we reach the hangar, one final speech is given for potentially our final hurrah. This is our most important mission. Whilst all of us are of different beliefs, nationalities or races, we do not fight for our ISAF, we fight for our homes. We fought tooth and nail for today, but one final deployment is standing between us and peace. Now, let us take back our shattered skies. Confirmed bandits, the new yellow squadron, basically any rookie who can grip a flight stick. They're easily picked off, they are so new. They don't even use call signs, instead referring to each other by name. And they're terrified when they see not a single Mobius aircraft, but a whole squadron. With the blue F-15 marking the crown jewel that is Mobius 1. In a way, it's a reverse of a lifeline. We're taking the role of the yellow squadron who arrived to destroy us. But there is no retreat, there is only battle which the new yellows lose, as we, 
Mobius 1 dive into the structure, targeting initially the three main generators, so that when the power goes out the commandos can take over and open up the missile silos, where it will be up to us. And as the final generator is downed, Megalith silos open as a panicked fanfare of instruments blares. But soon, it comes down. As if to say, we won. What remains is to land one final blow, and end it once and for all. And the narrator finishes his story. As the scent of burning jet fuel fades away, life returns to normal. As if the Yellow Squadron was never there, a runway turned back into a highway. As the narrator wonders if Yellow 13 found joy in that final dogfight, and whether or not he found peace in being defeated at last. To which the narrator concludes, And so, I write to you. And that's the story, but gameplay is just as important. Whilst it lacks some features from Zero, since release date wise, Zero released after 5 and acted as a prequel, whilst 4 was the first ever to release on the PS2, which means that the gameplay is a bit rough. First thing you'll notice is that the planes in AC4 are not as maneuverable as in the later entries, especially when comparing to AC7 which is the latest in the series, and also takes place in Yuzhia, but I digress. As always, the gameplay is as simple as fly plane, shoot guns, but you no longer have a wingman at your command, which I forgot to mention back in my Zero essay. You could command the wingman with the D-pad, but since there is no wingman, the D-pad now controls different things like your camera. There is no alternating story since Ace style was unique to Zero, and the same with alternative mission variants so every mission you play stays the same. But now I have to get to a part that I hinted at a couple of times. Now, please mind that I don't take any pleasure in critique, or as I see it, complaining. It's just spewing anger for the sake of anger, and sometimes it's just blown out of proportion or sounds hypocritical. Looking at you, any fandom I have ever been in, but I think... Ace Combat 4 is the only entry in the series where I didn't take pleasure from playing. No, it's not Burnout because Mission 10 Tango Line and Mission 13 Safe Return are my least favorite missions in the whole series. Look, I understand that there are people like me who tend to disagree with things like status quo. I might defiantly say that something like Tango Line is their favorite actually, and I have nothing against it but in my opinion, the 20 minute timer is just straight up overkill for this mission, and the distance between targets plus periodic attacks from Stonehenge just hurt the mission in the long run. Not to mention, the planes, despite controlling identically, feel like flying bricks compared to later entries. Like, it doesn't mean I dislike Ace Combat 4, but it's one of those I'm here for the abs, but there are some downs. Like, in a series where every entry I played so far brought me joy, a game that had moments where there was no joy sticks out like a sore thumb. And in my personal tier list, Ace Combat 4 would take the last place. Yes, even below Electrosphere despite its own PS1 control quirks. But remember, I'm not trying to downplay importance of Ace Combat 4, as it's not only the first PS2 entry in the series, and is the first in the so-called Golden Trilogy among 5 and 0, but it's also the first entry to introduce the world of Strange Real, though in its fairest and rougher form, where all of the world was extremely misshapen and Yuzhia basically was replacing Australia. Does that mean that canonically Yuzhians have an Aussie accent? Maybe. In terms of music, Ace Combat 4 has consistent bangers from Blockade, <laughs> to Stonehenge's themes, to Kamona, to 
Breaking Arrows 1 and 2 to Emancipation. To Farbanti. And of course, the killer duo Extremende Megalita Agonos Dei. And also all of the narrator's themes, which, speaking of, I'm glad that some of the commenters on my Tokyo Extreme Racer Zero video noticed that I included music from my favorite franchises in that video. And you know, I wish I experimented more with my background music choices, since I usually stick to the game's original soundtrack. The last thing I want to say before I depart is that in terms of emulation, Ace Combat 4 is unfortunately one of the most unstable in the series as some form of artifacting is present even if you use all the fanfixes and the correct settings. As you can see, for me, the ground textures in Mission 11 Escort were glitching out, and the credits at Mobius 1's first takeoff cutscene have black lines going across the screen. As always, I leave the guide I used in the description, and well, farewell Aces. And if there's a grand lesson to learn from Ace Command 4, well, it's about trying to remain human in the flames of conflict and not take pride in murder, rather take pride in fighter's honor.